When Selina Ogweno heard that her first child had sickle cell disease, she says her world came crumbling down. The stories she had heard of sickle cell disease were that no child lived beyond their fifth birthday. But determined to change this narrative, Selina volunteers her time at the Children's Sickle Cell Foundation, where I met her and other caregivers focused on rewriting the story of sickle cell disease in Kenya. Sickle cell anemia is misunderstood from the family setup to the entire uh, whole cohort of the community. So what we discovered is that uh, many young people are growing up, some are very shy to talk about their condition, some don't, some don't even know how to communicate it. These are children who go to schools. When they are in school, how do they communicate when they are in pain or they are not feeling well? <laughs> This is a lesson on how to tackle bullying of children with sickle cell disease. This hypothetical scene by the girls is in a school. They enact what sicklers go through as part of sickle cell disease awareness and sensitization to both caregivers, children with sickle cell disease, and their siblings. One boy just now told me that uh, whenever he's in pain, his teacher tells him, Jikaze kama mwanaume. You cannot do that to a disease. A disease, you can't get a place where you are either sick or not. And these are some of the things that we want to create awareness on. Always have positive attitude. Yeah, just as the teacher said, don't let your condition define you. Just be happy. No. The boys too had an opportunity to come up with a scene and enact it. <laughs> <laughs> the scenario here was almost real. A small boy living with sickle cell disease bullied by the older, bigger boys because of his height and weight. Seated here, I couldn't help but empathize with these children who have to navigate the world with the disease only those living it understand best. My project today is to meet my grandchildren sometime in the future. Um, and that's how, come, uh, that's how I got to join the Children's Sickle Cell Foundation. It was then a support group that was bringing in families together to just understand what sickle cell is and then from the experiences how they can uh, manage the disease. And uh, I met people who had great stories. Some had stories that were heartbreaking. But the good news was that uh, at least I met people who understood what I, my child had, and I was ready to learn from them. I also met a gentleman who was in his 30s, and that really encouraged me, like, OK, 30 and still counting. Selena's jovial nature is unmatched. Full of energy, Selena has immersed herself and her life towards families and children with sickle cell disease. From our own experience 16 years ago, she had one question for the pediatrician after frantically looking for him. Finally, when I got to talk to him, I just asked him, will I be able to see my grandchildren? The good news was that he laughed really loudly and said, yeah, why not? And I'm like, tomorrow I'm there. She had just been given news which, as a new and first-time mom, had broken her heart. In the hospital, we stayed for about 10 days. Still no diagnosis, they're just treating the baby, we still don't know why the baby is always anemic, why the jaundice. So we thought they were just because he, was, uh, he came in earlier than his time. So we thought those are some of the side effects. But then the 10th day into the ward, there's a doctor who came in to do a round. And as she was looking at his file, she asked for his surname. And uh, for me, I was a bit offended. Why a surname? You know, this tribalism thing. And uh, then she was told he's called Ogweno. And she's like, test for sickle cell. I was uh, pissed off. I was annoyed. I was like, what is this? And then uh, when they tested for sickle cell, we were told to go back two weeks later to get the results. And therefore, two weeks later, when I took him for the review, 
she confirmed that he had sickle cell. How oh, my world just fell apart because I have a nephew with sickle cell. I never paid much attention, but the only thing I know about sickle cell, forward backwards then, was that sickle cell is associated with early death. So I looked at my baby and I was like, oh my God, I'm about to lose my child to sickle cell. I didn't know how he got it. I was stressed up. When the doctor tells you your child has sickle cell and you feel like your world has fallen apart, how do you take this and how do you move on from that? It took a while because, you know, you meet people who have good stories, you meet people who have very bad stories. So you're always in between. But one of the most encouraging things was uh, Dr. Fula got to encourage us every time we met. And for me, one of the things that I put down was that clinic will be every month, whether the boy is sick or not. So what we did was that we made sure that every month we had a plan. We would go to the clinic and I'll tell Dr. Daktari, look at him and check if he's okay. And he'd be able to do a checkup and sometimes he'd be coming up with something, he'd sort it out before time. And that's what really helped us because with time we got to learn. And then we got also to learn the child's patterns. He had some interesting patterns where we would know when he behaves like this, he's about to get sick. So we'd go to the hospital without even thinking about it. And um, yes, it took a while. It took about six, to, six months to a year for us to now settle with this condition. But the one thing that we were not so settled about was, do we get another child? Because after all this we've learned, we know it's a genetic disorder, we know there's a possibility of another child getting this disease. Hmm, are we ready for that? And therefore, it was always a debate where for me I was thinking, why don't we just get these children and continue with this? Or, and my husband is like, let's take time and learn more about it. So that at least when we get the next child, we are prepared. So these are some of the things that came in. And then of course, trying to educate our relatives, my immediate family members and my husband's side, what is sickle cell, how this child got it, how it affects him. Ah, it took time. But the good thing is that everybody was receptive, of course cared, like what is this? But they were quite receptive and very, very, very helpful from both sides. The question of whether or not to get another child was heavy. Statistically, a couple who are both carriers, like the Oguenos, had a 25% chance that their next child will also have sickle cell disease, a 50% chance of being a carrier, and a 25% chance of being normal. To try or not to try? I asked Selena. Five years later, we got our second child, and uh, wow. I tell you, when we got him, have you ever just looked at your child and like, I can see all signs of sickle cell? When we were leaving the hospital after three days, I'm telling my husband, did you notice he's jaundiced? And he's like, yeah, 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 I noticed. So I again called Dr. Afula, I told him, this anxiety is going to kill me. I can't wait for six months. Is there anything we can do just to have an indication, indicative uh, idea of maybe what to expect? And yes, he agreed we did a HB electrophoresis and they spotted an A. So at that point we were like, okay, fine, whatever happens, this child is likely to be either a carrier or normal. And uh, when after six months we confirmed he is a carrier. Mm. So at least something that we could fight with. But I remember praying really hard to God, like, please, 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 give me a chance to work for you by not increasing the burden. And that was the second one at least to be at a place where we don't have to continue with this journey of sickle cell. One was enough. <laughs> How come this is often taken as a mother's burden? When you hear women talking about it or even going to the clinic, it's always the mothers, it's always the women who are here. Where are the fathers? Men want to give solutions, but when they don't understand where the solution is, they shy away. And that has been the issue. Even in the clinic at Baraka, for a very long time it was the mothers, until when they realized these kids don't get sick every day, these kids don't suffer anymore, so now they wanted to find out who is this, who is making this difference. So today, mothers are, I mean fathers are the ones bringing their kids. They're even following up. You know her clinic is due, his clinic is due. I gave this medicine, I gave that. 
And then that's when that confirmed it, that the fathers, yes, were there, but they were just frustrated. My child is crying, help me, how do I help him, and I don't know. So they shut down. So where would I take this, push the blame elsewhere, or run away from the right responsibility? But I must say that today we have many, many strong fathers who are actually coming in strongly and advocating for sickle cell. And they understand, they support their kids, they give them the love and the help that they need. And that has really opened our hearts to, it can happen. Yes, everything good is associated with the dad in Africa. The bad ones are always given the mother to sort out first, then they can be transferred. Ignorance plays a very big role in this, not only in this situation, everywhere. When people are ignorant about something, they try to do some weird things. But when people are trained, they come to the point whereby they get to know the truth. You know, it's very difficult to manage someone who is operating on half-truth. And uh, through this, we have seen so many families and so many marriages have been broken because when a child has been diagnosed with a disease, if it was the mother, most of them are mothers who take them to the hospital, who take care of the children. And when the doctors now reveal to them the, te the whatever is happening in, the, in this child, and when they take the information back home to the fathers that this child has been found to be suffering with the sickle cell. She has a condition called sickle cell. So most fathers don't accept and take it easily. They begin, at that point, they begin to blame the mothers. Through her work at the foundation, Selina has met many parents, including fathers. Peter Onyango Ahago is a father of three who is an electrical technician. His first two children have sickle cell disease. When my first uh, born daughter was diagnosed with sickle cell, it was after we had gone through a series of uh, challenges health-wise with my daughter because we didn't know actually what was uh, uh, happening in her life. She was sick every now and then. Until such a time, we were advised to test for the sickle cell. You know, we didn't know what sickle cell was. We could not even tell signs and symptoms. So we were just trying uh, trial and errors. We did a lot of trial and errors, trying to manage the condition of the child. And uh, we were managing what we didn't know. So the experience was so bad. At some point, we reached to a level whereby my wife was blaming me for the sickness of the child. I was blaming her because we were ignorant about um, the condition. So when we were advised to test for the sickle cell, then it was confirmed that uh, my daughter was indeed a sickler. So from that point is when we now started the journey with the sickle cell. Peter had tried all manner of things to find out what was ailing his daughter. You know, when you go to the villages, there are so many people who treat, uh, we call them herbalists. Eh? Of course, some work, some don't work. Some will pretend to be working. After some time, you are back to square one. The disease is an expensive affair that drains financially and, according to Peter, it is hard to plan for any major developments because as soon as one plans, the disease wipes away any savings because of hospital admissions or medicines that need to be bought. When we did these things that we were told to go and do by our doctors, we found things were now easy. There is no more crisis um, and... Uh, Things were normal, except the things that were bound to come. For example, uh, my firstborn, uh, again, you remember I go, I've got two warriors, the firstborn and the secondborn, but the thirdborn is okay, it's normal. So the firstborn, before we realized, 
And the second one also came with the same signs and symptoms. But now we had already known uh, some of the things, so it was easier to manage the second one. So we just took her for the test, we confirmed, and she started management, and she's okay. And now the first one, because we didn't know many things, she went into a stroke, she got a stroke, which we are managing up to now. Believing that knowing their sickle cell status was key in moving forward and taking care of their children, Peter and his wife got tested. We had to test ourselves just to confirm, because you see, when you just tell your partner you are a carrier, the other partner tells you you are also a carrier, how do you prove? The only way you can prove is through testing. So uh, both of us, we got tested. We found out that uh, we are both carriers. And uh, after getting to know our sickle cell uh, status, then we, we just accepted and uh, moved on. So our relationship is, is, is tight because no one blames the other person. We are all, if you were to blame, we blame all of us. So we have one thing in common and the only thing that can help us is when we, 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 we keep the relationship tight enough so that we uh, may be able to take care of our children. At the support groups, fathers are roped in as a key cog in the wheel of changing the fortunes of children with sickle cell disease. We involve these men, these fathers, through training and awareness. So we have seen a good number of them have responded and have embraced the situation and taken it positively and helping in the management and taking care of, of their children well. Selina believes that it is this kind of mindset by men that makes the difference for a couple and their children. I think you've had a very supportive husband and like the many stories that we hear from other women. I think I just got lucky and married the right person. That I would always say, he's, he's been, I tell you what I do today is because of his support and the love that he's shown all of us and the one thing is that he's not even in denial that this child doesn't have sickle cell or got it elsewhere. For him, it's all about what next? What can we do? Where do we go from here, you know? So the journey has been easy for me. I've been one of the luckiest, and I can say that uh, it's been wonderful. It's been a beautiful journey. Selena attributes her ability to wade through the ups and downs of bringing up a child with sickle cell disease to this strong support from her life partner. Interestingly, my son has never had a crisis. And when I say that, you see me cringing like, Ugh. I'm holding my breath because that's one of the things that I thank God for. He's never had a crisis. Not because we were the best parents or we know what you're doing, but I think because of those persistent clinics. For me, I was like, I'm not going to wait for a, another two months or be when he gets a crisis is when I do something. No. Every month, whether he's sick or not, let's go. Let's just, let's just check what's going on. And with that, it popped the dream of us uh, having a clinic. Because I kept on telling Dr. Fuller, I like that my son doesn't get really ill. He doesn't get sick. We always tend to manage the things just beforehand. And I was telling him, you know, it would be nice if every parent experienced what I experienced. And for us, our dream was to have a clinic where mothers could afford to bring their children without the strain of having to pay me a lot of money or one clinic is good enough, you know. And uh, it worked out because in 2014, the doors were opened to us at Baraka Medical Center and the first Tuesday of 2014, September, we started our clinic. And that was the beginning of that journey where it was not only my story, but my story now being re replicated to others and other mothers now having to speak the same thing and us having to learn from each other and saying, you know what, there's just one simple thing. Know your doctor, know your child, 
know your clinic and that will be the thing. Early diagnosis is definitely very important. Um, what do you think about newborn screening and even pre-marital genetic counseling for couples who are either carriers or who probably think that they are carriers or even they are sicklers themselves? What do you think about this? Newborn screening, thumbs up, because that will help a lot, especially with the, new ki with the children who are being born. But most importantly, let's not just do screening and stop at screening. If I took newborn screening to the rural setup today, what next? There's no clinic, there's no facility that can do continuity. The facilities are not well equipped. We will be burdening these people with a lot of information and no solution. So yes, newborn screening, I think it's very important. I think it's a very good way of now trying to manage sickle cell within the communities and country, but there has to be a solution to it. If I am positive, what do I need to do? There's a clinic that will take care of you for the rest of your life, put you on the right medication, on the right track. Um, premarital counseling, <laughs> if you told me, uh, those years, many years back that this is, uh, I don't marry this guy because he has sickle cell gene. And I knew what I knew. I'm not sure if I'd make, I'd make the same uh, decision. Because the person who I fell in love with is the one who I wanted to be with. And uh, therefore, it's important to give people information. Very important. And it's important that people also understand what may happen. And therefore, premarital counseling is very important. And it can also help solve many of these domestic issues. You know, people run away because they don't understand. But if I understood, you understood, and they're like, yeah, are you ready to take that risk? Yeah, OK, fine, let's go. I think many people would then go into it positively. But when it does happen, and I look at you, and you look at me, and they're like, who brought it? That's where the problems start, because people now start thinking, what is this new monster that's creeping into our relationship? So most importantly, what I would uh, say is that let's do premarital counseling, but with caution. Caution of let's give in, in information, let's educate, and let's give people the choice, the chance to make their choices. Now, when they make their choices, then they can actually then make better choices ahead as opposed to telling them you are forbidden from dating this person because of this and that. I think that would be disastrous because we'd have many broken hearts and uh, broken hearts are very hard to heal. There's no tablet for that. Almost two decades later, it is apparent that one's surname can no longer be a reliable measure of a likelihood of sickle cell disease. The surname is not going to help us diagnose sickle cell anymore. Today, we are having many people getting married from different parts of the country and even the world. So sickle cell being a genetic disorder, it's being passed from one parent to the child or both parents. Uh, actually, sickle cell is both parents to the child. And therefore, you cannot start saying that it's this parent or that parent or it's your surname or where you come from that will be the best indicator. And therefore, uh, it's not going to work. Then it was working because maybe 16 years ago, maybe that was the best way to diagnose it. But today, it's your blood that has to determine that. People need to get tested. People, because you see, there before, it was considered to be, you visited a health facility and uh, you are asked, hey, ini ilo gonjwa ya wajaluo? Ama yu gonjwa watu wa western? No, things like that. But as we speak today, Sickle cell uh, has traversed across the board. It's everywhere. People need to get tested. And uh, the only way we can control, you know, at the moment we are talking about management. We need to reach a point whereby we start talking about control. How can we control sickle cell? And more so in Kenya, is to get people tested, young people, those who are not in marriages tested, so that they know their sickle cell status so that when they get into a setup, marriage setup, if they choose to 
for example, when you get tested, you find that you are a carrier, because I know you are not a sickler, but you can be a carrier. And when you are now looking for a, a husband or a wife, you also need to get to know their sickle cell status. If possible, I would, add, I would ask them, you just need to stop this uh, process. I know sometimes it's difficult because these people have really gone far in their relationship, but I would advise it is better you stop this. Not unless, you know, nowadays also people come into this setup, marriage setup, not only to get children. And in Africa, I've seen young couples who are saying, no, as we are not, we don't have, we don't want any child. If you don't want any child, that's okay. But in case you are planning to have a child, please get tested make these decisions before this relationship go far. From the training that we see and some of the things that you're doing, there is a um, critical component of youth that you've involved uh, in the trainings and even in the clinics. How come a focus on the youth? How come you're having the youth as part of these trainings, as part of you know the journey and the support groups of sickle cell? The youth who are now the teens, are the ones whom we are targeting right now. How do you speak about your condition? How do you stand up, stand there and tell people that I am alive because I know what I have? People tend to associate sickle cell with death and that's not fair. It can't be that every time we look at you, we just see a bad story. These are people who are very successful. They have good brains. They achieve a lot in, in their day-to-day -day lives. So given a chance, we've seen that having the youth have their own sessions where we bring in experts who can teach them, train them, and equip them with information that makes them better people. So that when they have to face challenges in the workplace, when they face challenges in schools, with their families, they're able to speak out clearly to make sure that people understand what they're going through, as opposed to, ah, this one was just fine. Now look. She's here crying, she's sick. They're always pretending. She's like that. That's the story they have in their households. Their siblings not understanding them. Why are you always ill? Why is it that every time it's you, it's you, it's you and not us? These young ones are the people Selena, Peter and other caregivers have hope in to continue rewriting the scripts of people living with sickle cell disease. We are very happy that uh, today technology has allowed us to get the information that we have and people are living to old age. One of the things I want to, I'm so, so grateful for is um, being able to diagnose at the level of the clinics we have. At Baraka Medical Center, we, early this year we got a diagnostic machine, which is the HB electrophoresis, and a biochemistry machine, which we are ready to give the services to the people around that area at an affordable rate. Diagnosis of sickle cell has been so expensive that people opted not to get the right diagnosis but deal with the symptoms, which was more dangerous. Sometimes you find doctors were treating the wrong thing. Now today with that diagnosis machine, parents are more confident that they know what they're dealing with. I tested, I saw the results, and this is what we are treating. Then it was how sure are you that's what we are treating. So one of those, that's one of the things that needs to be put in all our centers, not only with Baraka, but all sub-county hospitals. They need to have a reference point for affordable diagnosis because sickle cell is a genetic disorder. It is something that has to be diagnosed to be managed. There's no way that somebody cannot afford it. It's unfair. I can't afford diagnosis, so I'll never know what I'm suffering from. The other thing that we really ask is that the government to help us with health funding. Health funding is expensive. And for these people, you being born with a genetic disorder already throws you off guard. So now you imagine you're trying to sort yourself out, you're trying to understand how do I get uh, money to even go for a checkup? And they're told the minimum you can pay is between six to 10,000. How many times are you going to do that? You're going to do it for lesser times or just not do it when you're only sick? So if NHIF can come in and support these families, 
just tell them that the minimum amount paid will be able to support these people. Some of them can't even afford that 500 per month. But yet they're supposed to go for that, pay for medicine, buy other things. It, it's, it's ridiculous. These are people whose red cells are affected. So you can imagine every part of your body demands care. We need to have organ checkups. How much does it cost to just do heart checkup? How much does it cost to do a kidney or liver function checkup? It's expensive. So let's not make it too sophisticated that only a few can afford, because this is a disease that cuts across. It doesn't care whether you are rich or not. Whether you can afford it or not, let's have a system which takes in everyone without having to create biasness on the haves and the have nots. And that is how everybody is going to survive. I was lucky because I could afford. But how many other people could not afford? Yeah. We thank institutions like even NEMA, Rorakawai NEMA, who are also bringing us in and giving us subsidized care for sickle cell. Why? Because they understand that you will not run away. So long as you come in today and you're still alive, tomorrow you'll come and the next day and the next day. So it's not about making money, it's about improving your life to give you a better chance of survival. People living with sickle cell are brilliant people. They're people who need opportunities to work. If they are given a proper health system that takes care of them, trust me, this economy would be even bigger than what it is right now. We would be having a percentage where the sickle cell community contribute to, and they are ready. Dr. Masikurir, for KT News Health Digest.